it is no longer new for us, but has actually um, been part of our tradition for a number of years. That's actually not true. Um, let me say that the fellows who have come back to their homes out northeastern, one of the side of Oswald this week, the fact that we get to bring these shows and then get them over a debt of gratitude to the As most of you know, Richard Daynard joined the faculty of the School of Law in 1969. But perhaps most importantly, that law and perseverance and the world. Now he's in an international remarkable turnaround in public opinion and Power of law system. What is success full circle? Fellows program represents a path to train lawyers. This dual commitment, which he shared with us, led to gain our to give us a gift and thus the power of Richard Gain our fellow program. Now award these fellowships to two attorneys, one of whom is a, a graduate of this law school and one of whom And we celebrate the importance. Before I go on, I'd like us all to thank Dick. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and I feel so honored and proud to be here. I thank Mother Nature for the nice weather, um, that my flight wasn't canceled, and that I'm here in this beautiful space. Um, so I wanted to just uh, get a sense of how many one else are in the room? Who else? Faculty? I guess that's the rest, right? <laughs> okay, that's great. So how many of you have heard of Lambda Legal before? That's good. How many of you have heard of the term community organizing before? Good. So I'm going to preface this uh, talk by saying I am an attorney by trade, but I'm, I'm a community organizer by heart. And if I, this sounds a lot like a community organizing training, I apologize beforehand. But I will try to give you my experience in trying to mix both, in trying to make it effective, and in trying to make it respectful of communities. And so I will try to ask you to participate some. And if you refuse, I will not become Socratic, I promise. <laughs> um, but I would like for people to just talk a little bit about the issues that they have seen or faced or have others seen or faced, um, and about what it means to live in a society where different people have different statuses and different power. And so by the end, hopefully, I'll have been able to share what in my professional experience has been a good way of combining all of these roles that one can play and what has been a good combination of what community groups or organizations or legal groups or government entities um, can come together to work on a common solution. So I will start, and hopefully this works. And I, I'm so happy you have a technology person because that's not my forte. So if you look at this image on top, um, how many of you have seen this image before? Okay. What brings to mind when you look at this picture? The first one on top. I don't bite and I don't call on people. Go ahead. Big fish eating little fish. Why? <laughs> Why, why can the little fish be eaten by the big fish? Yeah. That's right, one is big and one is small. What happens in the picture on the bottom? Yep. <laughs> and? That's right. And so there is... Um, a shift of what? From the top to the bottom. Power is shifted because the big fish, no longer the big fish, there's something bigger than the fish. So as many of you have been involved in community organizing, they know that there's a key concept here that means when you have unity and strength, getting lots of smaller fish together, you can actually eat the big fish, if, if that metaphor <laughs> sort of drives home, but it really means, community organizing means getting people together with a common goal, with affected by the same problem. In this case, the problem was a big fish ate me, but there are other fish who were being eaten by the big fish, and therefore, if we get together, organize, and find a common strategy, we could do something about our individual situation. And this is a graphic way of showing what community organizing means, um, and I will surely tell you it has different stages. It has um, a common thread of the power shifting, which you caught immediately. Um, and it also has a identification of the root causes of a problem, as well as identifying targets who can deliver that solution if necessary. Um, I think one of the most important things about community organizing also has to do with developing the leadership of members. And this is something that, as an attorney, I have always struggled with. Because if you set up a council member visit to come do advocacy, council members expect that who is going to do the talking? The attorneys. Why? You're the expert. You're educated. You're well spoken. You're well dressed, right? Okay. So how do you provide a space where community? members and community groups can have that and share that space alongside with you. And that's 
something I cannot answer in three seconds, but I'm going to try to go through all of the stuff I have to say today to make sure we cover into, go into what that means. Um, so, okay, so other stages of a, of a community organizing campaign would be clarifying a set of targets as to who can get you what you want, developing strategies um, on how to do that, and then build the leadership of, of the people. Um, then mobilizing for support, including media campaign, and then launching a campaign that's going to get you what you want. I'm going to give a couple of examples um, that are relevant to my work or related to my work. And so um, this past October, the Human Resources Administration uh, in New York City passed a policy that prohibits discrimination based on gender identity and sexual orientation. You would think New York City has a human rights law that covers both of those categories, but it doesn't mean that agencies are implementing the law and abiding by it. Um, it is the experience of many transgender and gender non-conforming um, applicants of public benefits that if they don't act masculine enough, or they don't act feminine enough, or they look like they're trying to pretend someone they are not, they are denied food stamps, they are denied applications, they are denied services. And so there is an organization in New York called the Sylvia Rivera Law Project that worked together with many other um, organizations like the Audrey Law Project, um, Housing Works, Chris for Economic Justice, um, and they combined their strengths and memberships together to make this campaign happen. Out of all the organizations on the Sylvia Rivera Law Project has attorneys and staff. And so this campaign was basically um, for transgender and gender nonconforming people to have a non-discriminatory environment in which they could apply for food stamps and Medicaid. Um, and through the process, they used protests, postcard writings, days of action, council member visits. And they did that alongside with the lawyers in a sense that I said before, the lawyers wouldn't be the experts or the spokespersons. The lawyers did give their legal, um, ex the legal expertise in terms of revising the policy and determining what legal implications it could have. Uh, but I think that the the most amazing thing about this campaign was that it involved four different grassroots organizations, and it also used um, the lawyers as the tools to make their campaign better, um, as opposed to drive or set the agenda or push everything um, that the lawyers thought would be the best in the best interest. And the reason is, um, attorneys, um, we all, <laughs> had privileges that others did not have like we went to high school, we did not drop out, or maybe we did, we came back. We got an education, we went to law school, we passed a bar, um, but we do not, or maybe knew at some point, but are not on the trenches as a gender non-conforming person in a, in a Medicaid office or in a welfare office. So for this for campaign in particular, it was so important to have the voices of the people who were experiencing the discrimination to say this is what we would need to feel safe and to have a way to redress if things are not happening the way they should be happening. Um, okay, oops, I went backwards. Um, the next um, campaign I want to give you a short, <coughs> brief explanation about is a safe space, uh, safe space, safe lives campaign from FEARS. And FEARS is a community-based organization also in New York City that organizes um, youth of color that identify as LGBT. Um, Hudson River Park Trust, what does that sound like? Development Corporation? <laughs> okay. Um, so this is a development co corporation that has been in charge of redeveloping uh, public spaces in New York City. And the way this redevelopment looks like in the Greenwich Village, which used to be a safe haven for youth of color, is that they are revamping parks, um, renewing spaces, and forbidding um, public access in certain times, having heavy police um, at certain times to keep the streets clean and to preserve the quality of life. What do you all think that means for youth of color? who hung out in the street and put them where? So how do they do that? 
So they basically, um, you know, renovated the space. It looked beautiful, clean. Uh, but any time young people came to the pier to hang out and to have some space for themselves, they got arrested for loitering, for uh, obstructing pedestrian traffic, for um, disorderly conduct, or for loitering for the purposes of prostitution. So these are the types of situations that affected primarily young people of color, and the organization began a campaign that included getting target people that could make changes. So most of these trust corporations have to get approval by community boards to do their work. They have to get approval for permits to build their benches and everything else they're going to put in a park. And so many of the, um, I mean, the steps in the campaign, including getting all of these bodies to understand that this was just not about beautifying and cleaning a neighborhood. It's about providing a space that's open to all, and all including gender nonconforming, transgender, and LGBT young people who hang out and have every right to be in the space that's public. And so in the past few months, um, some of the things they have accomplished was eliminating a 25,000 uh, fee charged to mobile service vans doing outreach on the pier because many uh, of the homeless outreach or LGBT outreach services go there because that's where the young people are. They were being charged 25000 to bring the van to provide services. Um, the next one was stop the proposal to shut down the pier at 10 p.m. Um, they were saying for the quality of life of the residents of the neighborhood, they didn't want any one hanging out after 10. They took that away. I think now it's, it's 11 or 1, 1 a.m., I can't remember. Um, prevented barricading of LGBT youth from Christopher Street at 1 a.m. Um, and then secure free LGBTQ programming on the pier. So now they have, I'm not sure if it's once a week or once a month, they have a specific LGBTQ youth uh, space and program that can happen in this community development. So these are just two short examples on how community organizing uh, works in, in the area in which I focus on. Um, how do lawyers help in these types of campaigns? So for this one, um, I think attorneys primarily had to understand and debunk what it means to be a community development corporation, what permits you need to get, who gets those permits, who approves what, because those were the bodies that the organizers had to go to and explain this is why this is not good for our community. Um, and so lawyers did most of the legal research in terms of what is happening here, what's the legal framework in which is happening, and who do we need to go to to, um, to make our, our needs known. They also had to go do research about, you know, what about charging a fee for a van for a pu public pu property administered by a private entity? So there's a lot of regulatory research that had to go into place. Um, and once again, once the meetings took place and they went to meet with the community board, et cetera, attorneys um, tried to play a, a long side role as opposed to, I am going to tell you everything I know about community development because what really convinced most of these bodies to make these concessions or changes was not the research done by the lawyers, but was the live, the stories of people and young, young LGBTQ youth who came and told them what this space provided. Why were they hanging out in the pier? Because they had been rejected and abused at home, because they have absolutely nowhere to go, because they have no relative that could help them, because they've been beat up in school. I mean, once those stories came across, things started to change. But no one can tell those stories better than the people who are most affected by them. Um, so I wanted to give you just a brief introduction about these two campaigns. This is a, a little bit more about fears. Um, I think if there were more such organizations across the country, there will be less work for me because I think uh, um, you know, youth will be engaged and involved and hopefully their families would be in a better place. But I think that it's so important that if you find yourself in a job like mine, in which you're very limited in terms of you work for national impact organizations, you only take impact cases, you do not provide direct services, um, there's only so much I can do to bring all the pieces together. But there are ways in which I could partner up with different organizations that do the grassroots work that are going to help develop the leadership. I also sometimes need to partner up with direct service organizations. Why? Because young people who reach me have no home, um, have um, parents that have you know, emotionally abused them and they need counseling. Um, sometimes they need a psychiatric 
uh, center and they need professional help to deal with trauma. So those are all things and direct services that I don't provide, that my organization does not provide. But I think partnering up and finding the right, the key services needed is really crucial in, in helping not just this one person, but have, helping the system change as a whole. So I'm gonna go a little bit more to power. Has anyone seen these pictures before? I'm gonna talk about invisibility now. <laughs> this picture is, is of a young um, gay boy in Puerto Rico. He um, identified as gay, but uh, dressed as a woman sometimes and hung out. He was, I think, 16 or 17 year old. He was uh, brutally murdered and dismembered by a sex partner a few months back. This was the 13th transphobic murder in Puerto Rico in 2010. Um, and no one knew about it. Why? I'm not blaming y'all. I'm just trying to reach the answer. Go ahead. How many of you have heard of New York City transgender murders last year? So what's the problem here? Or, do you go ahead? So the problem is this is a, is this is a low income poor transgender person um, that probably is not a donor to any of those big organizations. They probably also don't have the family support that some others could have and Violence against women is somewhat standard. Violence against transgender women is even more pervasive, and the worst part is seems acceptable. Why? Because transgender people, and this is a myth, are trying to be someone who they're not. Has anyone heard that? They're trying, yep, yes, okay. Transgender people do not know who they are, and they are confused. Anyone heard that? Okay, transgender people are trying to deceive um, the world. Yes? Okay, I'm gonna tell you what else I've heard. I've heard of transgender uh, women coming out of prison, going into probation offices the very next day, dressed as a woman, um, and being rearrested because of pretending to be another person, being sent back to jail. Um, I've seen of transgender youth who then become my clients being told, I am not going to call you by your female name until you get your genitals cut off. This is 2009, Juvenile Detention Center. Um, this is what I deal with on a daily basis. Um, and not me, because I just try to deal with the aftermath, but young LGBTQ young people, especially transgender youth, deal with this invisibility this hostility from society and this lack of acceptance. And much worse, once tragedies like this happen, there's really not much heard about. Um, so I think that, you know, this is just one aspect. I think if you're gonna become a public interest lawyer, there are gonna be so many other stories like this, whether it is, you know, the undocumented immigrant battered spouse or whether it is the senior person who got you know, a phone call from a lender saying they were gonna refinance her home and then got this like 23% interest rate and everything was taken away from them. There is really somewhere in some place, some forgotten and unseen tragedy that there are things to be done about it. And the first thing to do about it is to un take that veil off and show what's happening, right? Um, I bring these pictures to so many places, no one ever knew. Um, and it could be Puerto Rico, it could be New York, it could be Boston. 
But the problem is when someone does not have the characteristics of what we think is important, um, it doesn't really get shown in the media. It doesn't, it's not given the importance that it should be given. Um, so let me go back forward, I should say. Okay, so that brings me to the next short section I want to cover, and I want to talk a little bit about power and power in our society. So can someone tell me when they hear the word power in the social context, what do they, what do you, what comes to your mind? Yep. Money. Why money? Okay, so the, the, the concepts, access to resources, resources, and then money usually gets you that, this comment. Go ahead. So the ability to allow or restrict things from people or from... Okay, so allowing or restricting people of what they can or cannot do. What else? One more. Go ahead in the back. Okay, so the, the ability to self-determine or make decisions on your own about something. Yes, okay. So all of those things combined, who traditionally has had the most ability to do all those things in society? Who? Men. What else? We're getting more specific. <laughs> um, and so what does it mean for the, those who don't fit that description so squarely? Less or no power, or you are on the other side of the power, which, mean, which means you have no access to certain things because someone has power over you. Um, and so we're talking about the other concepts associated with power. We talked about money. We talked about resources. Um, and we talked about like self-determination, which means you being able to make a decision for yourself. And I think that those are all concepts that are part of community organizing and social change. They play different roles and parts, but I think that the most important key element to understand here is that the collective power um, of people being organized can sometimes trump or make the person in power do the things that we are requesting from them to do. And I will explain a little bit of this in more detail when I talk about the other campaigns I have been involved with. But um, I think it's so important to have this analysis in your mind, whether you're an attorney or a community organizer, because you could um, develop a strategy much better once you understand who has the power to change the things that you're fighting for. And so if you are fighting for a peer that is open to all young people, regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, or race, uh, you need to figure out who has the power to, to give you that. And then you have to organize the social power to come to that one decision maker to make that happen. And so it is so important to figure this out externally, but it's also important to figure out it out internally. And so I want to talk a little bit about power within the legal system. And that means within our court system and our legal system that was set up primarily by who? You know, let me, huh? Anybody know? You took constitutional law, right? <laughs> who drafted the thing? Right? Um, and it was done to serve who? Okay. Um, and so then those who became lawyers or judges were who? Okay. 
Um, and, you know, throughout history, women had more access to become educated and women became attorneys. And throughout history, people of color had access and more and more LGBT identified attorneys have access. But I think we have to recognize the limitations of our system. We work in a legal system that was created within a framework and within a structure to serve a particular type of people. Um, and we could make reform and changes, but we have to also be so critical to find the limitations. Legal advocacy and impact litigation is not always going to resolve the entire problem, I could assure you that. Um, but there are many ways in which it could be helpful. The other thing about analyzing power within ourselves is that we have to put ourselves in the pictures. And ourselves, I mean the legal advocate. Um, when I became an attorney for um, Mothers in the Move in the South Bronx, I focused on housing rights. Um, I worked with uh, tenant associations that were being formed in the South Bronx. And if you know anything about the South Bronx in the 70s, um, the conditions about the crack epidemic were so bad, and most of the places were taken over by crack dealers that many landlords decided to burn their own buildings to cash their insurance money because that's the only way they could sort of get their money out of their investments. And so that happened in the 70s, and the housing stock in the Bronx was just really horrible since then, and the conditions were, are, are still really bad. But in any event, I was working with tenants uh, who lived with a hole in their ceiling with rats and roaches. Their kids had lead in their blood. Um, and here I came after my clerkship in the Supreme Court with my little suit and entered into a home. And they were like, what are you talking about? You don't know what it's like. And I don't know what it's like. Um, you know, I have all these privileges that, that I have to acknowledge, otherwise no one will connect to me. Um, if I just focus on, I'm gonna get your problem solved, tell me everything that is wrong, and I ignore the fact that she has a child that has lead poisoning, that she's not taking care of this child, that there's so many other social needs, I also am not doing my job. And so I think there are many things that we have to acknowledge that once we're working with clients, we are in a power position that is different than theirs. And in order to empower a, 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 a person that is having all these problems on top of everything else they've gone through in their lives, we really have to understand that we are coming from a privileged position and that what we say matters, the way we say things matters, and the, the way to gain the trust of a person is to really step back and say, you're the expert here. You know what it is like to, to have your ceiling fall off. You know what it is like to, to have absolutely no other recourse but to live here. You have, you know, you have seven kids, you're on public assistance. It's not your fault. The system is not providing opportunities for you, but you have to step back and instead of trying to just fix it all, you have to step back and say, I don't know it all. I know the law, but I don't know what the reality means, of your reality means. And I think if that attitude were adopted by many attorneys, they would, it would be much more different and they would be much more effective in building a trust relationship with their clients. Um, the same thing happens to me now with transgender young people. I identify as bisexual, have definitely suffered discrimination because of it, but I have no idea what it is to be a transgender girl in a boys' correctional facility being taunted and harassed every day. So, um, I think it's so important to put our privileges up front and acknowledge them so that then we can give the space for the people that are most effective that are our clients to give us their story and not just for the legal purposes, but I think there's also an empowerment that happens when a young person or an adult person with a problem is allowed to express their problem in their own words, in propose their own solutions, uh, work together with a possible litigation or non-litigation aspect, um, we have to understand that when someone hires an attorney, it's a very disempowering experience, especially if you're a low-income person. Why? And I will tell you why. Who decides if, if, if a case will be taken or not for representation? The attorney. Um, who decides what's going to be an achievable outcome from a court? 
the attorney, um, who decides how much time and resources can be committed to a particular case? The attorney. Um, how is the client empowered in this relationship? Not by the legal strategic decisions, right? The client is really empowered by the way in which you approach the relationship to be more equal. Um, and I will give you a warning about impact litigation that is not accountable to a client or a community or a movement. Um, if we don't make, if you don't, we don't take the time to acknowledge our privileges and make this connection to bring community groups to the table, we could end up with cases that have absolutely no ties to the reality. And I've seen some impact litigation work that have really good intentions, really set goals, but if you lose that connection with the people on the ground, um, it could just simply have a change that is not gonna work in practical life. Um, so it is really all about power. It's really all about balancing your status as an attorney with your clients. And I think one of the things I have found most helpful is to number one, bring in as much resources outside your work as you can. No job, I think I was meeting with a law student right before this lecture, not one job is gonna be designed with all of the pieces together in place. If you work for a legal services organization, you're gonna have a 100 cases caseload, you're gonna have revolving clients, you're gonna have this is what you do. But guess what, you could partner up with a community-based organization that's doing organizing on that same issue, you could refer your clients to that community organization. If you have two clients in the same with the same problem that live in the same area, you could put them in touch. If you um, are doing direct services and want to belong to a ABA committee on ending discrimination in the courthouse, et cetera, you could do outside activities of your paid work um, to try to get the pieces from the other side that are needed to create change. Um, let me move forward so that we could have a bigger picture of things. So I will tell you a little bit more about how this all fits together. And I borrowed from the Organizing for Social Change, um, the Midwest Academy Manual. In their, in their conception of social change, um, there are four pillars that are, that are good, that are necessary for social justice. So they have the service, and I think in service, direct legal services fits in there to meet the survival needs of people. So housing, shelter, clothing, you know, living in a safe environment um, fall into there or not having your liberty taken away from you. Um, we have policy work, which I have in some of the examples talked about. And sometimes the community organizing really is targeting to have a policy change or a law change. Um, but that's also very important. And then the other two pieces that I have somewhat talked about before are, you know, consciousness raising of the people that are most affected by the problem, the little fish that come together to become a big fish. Um, and that's usually done through media advocacy as well as popular education and leadership development. Um, and then we have, you know, the autonomous community power um, that's done through base building and, and leadership development that in the long run allows uh, communities and people to be able to have that power that someone was talking about to make the decisions for your own life on your own and not having to make decisions, having decisions made for you <laughs> or from a system or from uh, someone in a position of power. Um, this kind of sounded really boring to me the first time I looked at it, but I can tell you once I've done a couple of public service projects, it has really come down to these key elements that I see if you're going to do combining community organizing and legal work. So I see community organizing as a key part, but I also understand the limitations. There are very few organizations that have a legal arm and do community organizing. In this economic times, it's so very hard to fund the little community organizing organizations to begin with that for them to have an attorney on staff is sometimes very difficult. But I think we should always strive to include some, some sort of community organizing entity in, in, our, in our work. Um, and like I said before, you don't have to be working for you know, the community organizing group. You could work for a legal aid office. You could work for a public defender. You could work for the 
you know, attorney general's office, but as long as whenever you're dealing with an issue, you're including some who are working directly on the ground with the people most affected, I think that's so important. Um, the next one is, is direct legal services. I think many times when we deal with a social problem or issue, there are life and death situations. You know, someone needs a roof over their head, someone needs health care to be well and alive, um, and someone also may need um, you know, representation in dealing with discriminatory treatment, and those are things that are sort of desperately needed to just, to just be, to just survive, and I think that a person cannot become a good organizing leader if, if they don't have the basics, and so this type of legal services are also very necessary. Um, we also have impact litigation. I do know um, impact litigation has lots of challenges in terms of it is really not meant to be a community building resource. It's really meant to um, you know, set a precedent for certain laws to change. But it really has to work hand in hand with the other two. Because if not, if there's no connection, then it could just change a law without any link to reality like I mentioned before. Um, and then we have legislative and executive action because it could be a case in which you had a good community organizing, you had good services, you changed the policy, but then all of a sudden it's not being implemented or it's not working. Or, you know, you had a one case, and I will tell you, um, Lawrence versus Texas, you all heard about. Okay, so I am glad. Um, so it basically declared sodomy's laws unconstitutional. Do you think all states have repealed their sodomy statutes. So we got stuck up there. Uh, why is it that there's no follow-up? Or, or, you know, like when we fight so hard to get sexual orientation or gender identity included in a human rights or anti-discrimination law, and after many years of, of doing that, it happens, then why is it still happening? Why is it that New York City still needs the Human Resources Administration to adopt a non-discrimination policy when there's a law that is, that is making it happen? It really is just, for me, a sign that it really all of these pieces have to be in place and they have to have some traction. You cannot just do community organizing. Um, I'll tell you my experience when I worked for the United Farm Workers. I was a community organizer in Tallahassee, Florida. The KKK office was like three roads down the road, or three, you know, three minutes down the road. Um, it was the first time the UFW was organizing mushroom workers in Florida. There was a lunchtime protest. Um, 120 workers got fired on the spot. No legal recourse at that point. Three community organizers, no attorneys. There was nothing we can do legally. They couldn't go back to work the next day, and so. You know, we needed to go get some attorneys who could help the workers to get their job back. And yes, five years down the line, this mushroom plant was unionized, but it really took all the pieces to come together. Um, direct services only doesn't work either. You will see a revolving door. You will continue to see the same clients with the same problem coming, coming and coming. Um, impact litigation alone without no, no context in a community or, or reality also doesn't work. So I really think to, to get the social change going and to, for it to be complete has to bring all the pieces together. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more details about my past work experience and I hope I'm doing good on time. I am. Okay. So I will tell you a little bit about my work at Mothers in the Move. Like I said before, I work with the tenants um, associations. They have a housing committee. Um, and they, they work with tenants in the South Bronx to improve their conditions. So this is the way we set up this, this project to work. Um, I worked at the Urban Justice Center, which is a straight legal organization. They do primarily direct services and some impact litigation, but they have no membership base. And so I set up uh, my Scanner Fellowship so that I would have my legal supervision from the legal organization. I worked two days in that office, two days out of the week. I, three other days I worked at Mothers and the Move in their Bronx office. Um, the way we set this up was that I provided direct representation for non-payment and eviction cases so long as the member was member of the organization. 
um, and also became committed to be a tenant leader in their building. And so we tried to tie the direct services to the legal representation to encourage organizing. Did it work? I think it worked. In the beginning, right before I came to court, right before we had to get them a settlement, and once my court representation was over, did their participation decrease? Yes. But it got them in the door. And even if their participation decreased in the tenant association, you know, two months down the line, they learned that community art organizing was a good way of getting things done, that you do need a lawyer to get your legal help. But Mothers in the Move does not only do housing, they do environmental justice, they do youth justice. So I think that even if it got a member on the door to the organization and to know a little bit about community organizing, the next time they face another problem in their lives, they came back to Mothers in the Move to do something about it. So it doesn't work perfectly. People are not committed to organizing for the entire life just because I did their eviction case. But they did learn a little bit of something. So I think tying your direct services to some type of commitment to become involved in the community, it's, it's a good thing. It doesn't work 100% all the time. The other thing we did is um, we did a lots of community education workshops in which people learn about you know, eviction procedures and what landers can and cannot do and, and when, you know, how they should organize and how organizing is protected um, under the law. We did them in Spanish, in English, we did them in their houses, we did them in the parks, we did them in the, um, in the office of the community organization. And we had incentives that if you came to the community or the, the community talk, you would get a free consultation with an attorney. So that was another way of combining, like you will get the legal services, but hey, come involved even if it's a little bit. Um, and so that was, that, was, that was a good way to combine both. Um, I didn't really do much impact work. I did a lot of relocation contracts that became very technical in nature. Uh, many of there were there were huge developers in the Bronx that sort of redeveloped some buildings, and then there was corruption in the organization, and the leaders left, leaving the, the development corporation bankrupt or something like that. So we had to work with the attorney general's office to revamp these organizations. It was such technical work that I couldn't really relate this to the tenants. They wanted to just to get a better housing, um, and so the, what we did is uh, we created this community study groups in which tenants came together with law students that I was working with to learn about how these community development corporations work in terms of revamping housing and things like that. Uh, we used that as a tool to get them more involved into understanding what the relocation agreement meant and why it took so long because people got desperate. All of a sudden, they're like, three months have gone by and you still haven't gotten my relocation agreement. But I think one important part, and I'll go about this later, part of the community lawyering that, that I have seen works is sharing information. Many times we tend to just like, it's just easier if I do it, it's easier if I understand it all, and the tenants just sit there and wait for me to finish your contract, as opposed to bringing them in to understand why things are taking this long and why, why does the attorney general need to be involved. And so sharing information is key, I think, into community lawyering that, that is more equal and it's on the same level as, as your client. It may take a lot more time than if you never explained anything to your client. Um, and of course, you're not working on the billable hour schedule. <laughs> but um, I think it's so important to share, even if, even if it's the most technical information, bring it down to terms of, you know, that lay people can understand and just bring in your, um, your client to be part of the process, even though they're not going to be as technical as you are, but just bring them in. Um, so I'll go back to the next one. Um, then I worked for Esperanza del Barrio, and this I had the privilege to have uh, another fellowship that gave me full funding to start up an organization. They paid for my salary for a year and a half and gave all kinds of technical assistance. Um, I work with Latina street vendors in New York City. Many of them, um, undocumented immigrants who post 9-11 um, had no jobs and decided to do what they knew best, which was cook delicious Mexican or Latin American food. 
and they started to sell it in the street. Um, and as you may understand, you know, selling food in the street has all kinds of health implications. Um, and you obviously require a license to do so. Um, and so what happened in New York City is in, during the Giuliani administration, there was such heavy enforcement of uh, vending laws and, and violations. Everyone got picked up, the Arabs, the Mexicans, the, everybody. Um, and then there was a period in which um, community boards organized and got community boards primarily made by store owners, organized I should say, and, and got the number of permits capped so that there were no more permits for street vendors. Uh, but I think the main problem we started tackling with in, in my neighborhood, which is where I lived, was that many of the, these women, uh, because of their immigrant status, were not even able to get their personal license to vend because the law on the book said, in order to get your vending license, you need to be a legal permanent resident or show a green card. And so, we wouldn't realize this until down the line, but the main problem that many of the women came to me with was I'm being arrested, my stuff is being confiscated, I'm being threatened that my kids are gonna be taken away. And, uh, you know, some of them got arrested two or three times a week. They lost all their food, and then by the end of the week, were even, you know, had a debt because now they had to pay all the money that they didn't make plus everything they lost, and they spent three days in jail. Um, so most of the things we did involved direct representation. I represented many of these women in criminal court. I challenged many of the um, takings of their property, uh, but. I could still be doing that today if we didn't involve some other type of legislative or community organizing campaign. So we started an organizing campaign to get this law changed, that their city should not require immigration status in order to change, in order to get your vending license. And so we started, number one, getting more members to the organization, street vendors not from East Harlem but from many other neighborhoods in New York City. We also started doing the research, and I, I partner up with, with the NYU Immigrant Rights Clinic. I partner up with private practitioners. Um, and I will, this is my cue to say, anywhere you work, even if it's a huge corporate law firm, there is a place for you to be part of this process. Um, even at Lambda Legal, we rely heavily, we're a big national organization, we rely heavily on pro bono uh, law firms that co-counsel with us to bring like the biggest cases we have brought. And so there is someone friendly in some big law firm that pushes for pro bono hours to be a priority, that pushes to have an LGBT community or a diversity community, whatever it is. So anywhere you work, even if you're a solo practitioner, we also need your assistance in making some of these things happen. So it's another very important part of the puzzle. Um, so in any event, so we started this campaign I kept doing the representation, why? Because people needed to get out of jail. <laughs> people needed to get their stuff to eat. Uh, but in the meantime, we started working with city council members and with others. Um, this is where it became most challenging to keep this balance between my power relationship and members. Um, I went to city council hearings and they were like, you testify, they don't even speak English. I'm like, no, they testify, you provide translators. There is no way, um, uh, you know, th I could keep driving this campaign led by the community, and then when it came to the city council here, and I would say, okay, now you sit down, I'm gonna talk for you. It would really undo all the work that it took so many months to make. So, but this is a leadership style that not many policymakers, Congress, or government bodies are used to. So I must warn you, you will face, if you try to this creative types of leadership development, you're gonna face um, challenges. Um, including the translation, including all of these things I mentioned before. Getting into government buildings with five undocumented women with no ID, that's a challenge. Um, or, you know, even my current clients, getting into government buildings with a transgender girl who has no ID with a female marker, do I wanna get into it with the community, maybe with the security guard about whether, why her ID is says male or female? It is challenging, but I think it is doable. Um, and like I said, there are many resources that we could reach to and bring into our work. There is not one job that is gonna have it all. And even, I had the, the privilege to have two fellowships that allowed me to build my own projects. But eventually, 
fellowships are money driven, resource driven, and they finish. And in these economic times, maintaining that type of funding is, is difficult. So I think that, you know, this is a puzzle that we have to draw resources from everywhere to make it happen. I will tell you the end of the story. The end of the story is that after three and a half years of campaign, uh, Mayor Bloomberg finally changed this archaic law and removed it. Now, no one has to show legal immigration status. All they have to show is that they're paying taxes in order to get a vending license. There was still a problem with the caps, but at least this law was, was removed and this campaign was successful. What happened to my legal work after that is that no one was getting arrested and I was not representing anyone in court anymore. <laughs> Um, and so I kind of, you know, drove my path to a different set of my career in which I wanted to do more legal work that was impact litigation, and then I went to Lambda after this, this, this job. But um, I must tell you, it is, it is challenging to make creative, you know, combinations of services and community organizing, and it's also challenging to keep it moving. Change, things change, and, um, and then you look for something different to do, like I did. Um, so I'm going to try to put it all together for you and see if we could make sense of this. So what can lawyers do to combine all these little pieces that we talked about today? So I think there are ways in which you could be more like a community organizer while being an attorney. And I mentioned it briefly before. You have two clients with the same problem in the same situation, in the same neighborhood, et cetera. You could put them in touch. It's not illegal to do that. Um, of course, you could get consent from each to give their name or whatever it is, but I think you could do a lot like a community organizer while you're being a lawyer um, and representing people. Um, I think there's also really important to think about your client's long-term political power, and this is where we have to you know, bring in the organizations that are doing some, you know, or community organizing or conscious raising or political work. Do referrals. There's nothing bad about doing referrals to organizations that are doing some of the more active work. Um, respect community's autonomy. I think this is part of the whole, you know, challenge of recognizing our own privileges and respecting decision making from the community. And it, it really fits into impact organizations like Lambda Legal. Many times at Lambda Legal, we think that this type of equality is good for the community, and we go find ourselves plaintiffs to do this type of cases. Um, but it may turn out that some community group has been working on something else and we haven't even realized that that's happening. So I think it's so important to balance, right? We are looking for cases, we are looking for plaintiffs, we also need to listen to what community groups and LGBT groups are working on. Um, the next one is watch for replicating structures of oppression and this is quite complicated, which I don't have time to go into the whole thing, but you know, we kind of talk a little bit about who was this legal system made for and by who and for whom. Um, I could say the same things about, you know, large legal organizations that were founded and worked for and take issues that really affect a certain group of people. Um, even the small community-based organizations that do grassroots community organizing could be very sexist and very transphobic or very anti-immigrant in their own ways. And so most of the oppressions that we're trying to fight against um, are internalized, and I have them, and you have them, and everyone does as well, and they replicate themselves in some of our own organizations. So I think that's something that's really important to watch for um, because it is sneaky. <laughs> um, you know, oppression and internalized oppression are, are sneaky, and sometimes I heard a speaker once call them unconscious biases, and I heard that that's, that's better. So I'm going to call them some unconscious biases. We have and we carry them where, wherever we go because we learn them from the time we were born or even before that. Um, so it's, it's always important to check ourselves and our organizations for you know, racism, sexism, homophobia, or even classism. Um, and this I've mentioned so many times already, but partnering up with an active campaign or community group is always so important. Even if you're doing you work for an organization that just does policy work. You could still partner. You could still talk to other people. If you work for legal services, you could still partner with, with community organization and community groups. Okay, and this may get a little repetitive, but I, I said before there are many other creative ways to be lawyering, and it's not just the court case. Um, it could involve 
community education. You know, I go across the country and talk to probation officers, judges, family court advocates. Um, it's part of my work. Why? Because it builds the consciousness that discrimination against LGBTQ youth should not happen from anybody, from a social worker or from a judge. Um, petition drives, you know, public demonstrations, lobbying, campaigns. Lawyer roles can be applied to any of these settings. You know, public demonstrations usually have police, um, I don't know how to call it in a nice way, but police get involved in public demonstrations in, in ways that are not constitutional. So sometimes legal observers are really needed to document and to even get people out of jail if they get arrested. Um, you know, lobbying and campaigns. There's a lot of legislative research, legislative history you can help a community group get. Um, and there's so many things you can do as an attorney to help um, a movement. Um, I talked about this already. Alongside and following the lead means you step back and allow leaders and clients to speak up. Um, why? Because there is the assumption like you yourselves identified that if you have a lawyer in the room, the lawyer will do the talking and the advocacy and is going to get me what I want. If you try to think about a more creative model, you can allow your clients to speak um, and, and tell their own needs by their own. I don't think you could do that in court, but yes, you can too. When you have your client testify, if you will, you could have a client, um, you know, you could, you could tailor your litigation strategy accordingly to give more space for your client to talk. Um, and next I'm going to stake the case with low chances of success. And this is so hard to drive home when we have very little resources in our impact organizations or legal services. Why on earth would I take a you know, transgender woman's sexual harassment case to federal court if I know she will be not credible because she's a criminal. There is a prison litigation reform act that prevents types of recovery that could happen. Um, and you know, her, you know, the prison guard that allegedly abused her is going to testify and have another 15 guards testify whatever happened did not happen. Why would I take that case anyway? Would you take the case? What else? Remember those blue circles I put together? Go ahead. What about your client? What's the client going to do? Oh, go ahead. And so what about the client? What, what opportunities will you be giving the client, even though you know she's going to lose in court? A voice? Mm -hmm. And what else? Go ahead. Right, to face the people who, who confronted her. And then the other thing is, if you're going to do media work, if you're going to do uh, partnering with some other organization, the client is going to have a chance to learn more, develop her leadership skills, get to know more people. If it becomes public, she may, you know, start a group, start a policy reform. I mean, there's so many things that could happen from a losing case um, that it's always important to not just think this is not legally feasible, but 
could it work with community support and in other ways to make change happen? Um, and I think that that's so important because, yes, we have limited resources, but sometimes a losing case could be a seed planted to make change happen elsewhere, I mean, in another way. Um, okay, and then the last one is also, I do think it's coupled where you take the losing case, but you have to also at the same time recognize there's going to be limitations to the legal system, even if you win. And you may have to involve all the other blue circles, the community organization and, and the legal advocacy, even if you win in court, because you're going to win in court for one client if you only did one case, unless you're doing a big class action. But I think it's so important to recognize the limitations of the legal system in that, again, it's not going to by itself solve the problem. You really have to involve the other pieces um, into making a, a, a broad solution. Um, okay, so a few last things. Um, I said before something about sharing information with your clients and encourage them to take leadership. I think this is so important because like I said before, you're gathering all the technical information, you're gathering all the procedural information, and then you may want to just go tell your client, this is what we're going to do, which is very different than saying, let's learn together what it means and why it's taking so long and why they denied your appeal and why they did this. It just takes more time. It just takes more effort, but it, it will have a greater result for your client and for those similarly situated. Um, I mentioned this before. Again, it is always important to take your client as a human being that needs to survive. When I get a call from a young person on the run in the middle of Kentucky, um, there's not much I can do in terms of bringing a civil rights case, even though the person could have great claims. If I don't get this person to be stable and to have a roof or somewhere to live, and so it's so important to figure out that there are immediate legal needs that need to be met. And if your organization or your practice cannot do it, it's really important to get help from the direct services organizations that may do, they may meet the direct needs. Um, and then I also mentioned some of it before. Um, supporting community organizing um, should be in ways in which the community groups find it helpful, and we talked about direct action support if you do protests, et cetera. But I think there's also a great opportunity to do defensive work, and by defensive work, I mean when a not, the small not-for-profit organization is going to get evicted from their place because this huge mall is going to be built. That's something that it's an immediate impact on the organization and the causes they're fighting for. Um, other types of defensive work may mean you know, someone's 501c3 status was denied by the IRS for some technical reason. Um, they need the 501c3 to function. So there are so many other uh, ways in which community groups need uh, support and help from lawyers, not just on the substantive part of the work that they're doing, but also in their infrastructure, in becoming a 501c3, and in doing the types of things that will allow them to just keep going. Um, let me see what else we have here. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about, in the next 15 minutes, about a particular case that my organization worked with. And like I said before, most of the principles I talked about in general in this lecture cannot be applied and cannot be combined in one workplace. Otherwise, we wouldn't have collaborations between organizations. But I will tell you what we did with this particular case. It was um, Rodriguez v. Johnson was a federal lawsuit brought to um, federal court in New York, um, and we represented Alisa Rodriguez, who is a transgender woman who was uh, taken off her hormone treatment. She was, I think, 16 when she got arrested, but since age 12, she had already been on hormone treatment with parental consent um, and was living as a woman. When she got arrested, she was placed in OCFS custody in the boys' unit. She was forced to get a haircut, and she was taken off the hormones cold turkey. She was also reprimanded for expressing a, gen a female gender identity and doing a, you know, a female hairstyle. Um, and then she suffered all kinds of emotional and physiological consequences from being cut off the hormones just cold turkey. Um, we represented her, um, and filed the case together with the Silver River Law Project. So we try to combine the community organizing slash attorney 
and the impact litigation organization to bring the case. Um, the case resulted in a settlement, um, and then OCFS committed to working with the community to develop LGBT guidelines and policies. Um, there had been a case right before this one that was litigated by the ACLU in Hawaii, and they, when this case was filed, they were working on developing their policy. But basically, the Hawaii and the New York were the first um, LGBT policies in the country to address the needs of LGBTQ youth in, in juvenile settings. Um, like I said, we co counsel with Sylvia Rivera Law Project, and Sylvia Rivera is a pretty unique organization that does combine community organizing and, and lawyering. Um, they, at that time, was, were working with Alyssa in other meeting the, her other immediate needs. Uh, when she came to the Civil River Law Project, she had been out of placement already, and I think some time had passed. So she was, um, in, you know, she was not in, in a detention facility anymore, and she became pretty involved in their um, organizing campaigns, not related to the criminal justice, but she was involved in other community organizing campaigns. Um, so the case settled, and for the next year and a half, um, there was a working group formed in which we got input from all kinds of people from the community to make this policy what it is today. So we worked with the Sylvia Rivera Law Project. Uh, we worked with Green Chimneys and SEO Family Services. They're both LGBT group homes in New York City, and both young people and staff helped shape what the policy is now. We had people involved from the Correctional Association of New York. They have an LGBTQ youth program called Safe Passages, and it's a leadership training for the summer. Um, so we had them involved as well. We have Legal Aid Society, which are the, both Legal Aid Society and Lawyers for Children are the two main organizations appointed to represent young people in delinquency cases, so they were part of the process as well. Uh, we also had former youth in care who have, are part of our national advisory network, but we had young people who had been in detention who identified as LGBT come and say these are the things that should work and may not work while in detention. And then we had bigger organizations like Empire State Fire Agenda as well as the CUNY Center for Women's Development. But it was, this was a really good example of trying to bring in together all kinds of groups and especially the young people and those that directly care for them to develop a policy that would, would make sense and that will keep LGBTQ youth safe. Now, is the OCFS policy the best policy ever? No, it has some, you know, it has really good things, but it also has um, really extraordinary accommodations that many of the corrections facilities do not give. And so I'll give you, so I'll tell you briefly, this OCFS policy has initiation and continuation of hormone therapy for young people who either came without the therapy but, or, or came already taking hormones from the street or came with a prescription. They all are, in a way, assessed that they can continue or start their therapy. Um, they have safety transfer. If a young person feels safe or threatened because of the sexual orientation or gender identity, they could request an immediate transfer from the replacement. They also have mandatory staff training for staff and voluntary contractors. Um, they also have a policy about names and pronouns that uh, young people can be called by their preferred name or pronoun that matches their gender identity. Um, and they also have uh, options for clothing and grooming that could match their gender identity. So a new transgender girl that comes into OCFS hopefully will not ever have to experience the type of discrimination that Alyssa was subjected to. Um, and so, again, this was a community effort that is not straight up organizing because there's not many organizations doing organizing of juveniles in detention because they're locked up. But it involved as much as we could uh, a part of the community, including youth formerly in care, youth in group homes, as well as their attorneys that work for them. And, you know, the policy nowadays has been used to model other policies. We have now states like. Um, Pennsylvania and New Jersey that have similar or better policies, but it has really been something that um, has driven sort of the policy in the child welfare and juvenile justice world related to LGBTQ young people. Okay, um, again, I want to finish with this and leave a little bit of a few minutes for questions. Um, like I said before, most of the things I try to put together today are not a straight-up solution, 
but I do think they're the little pieces that can come together. And any law practitioner, whether you work for government, for a law firm, for a policy group, or do direct services or impact litigation, you have a role to play. And it's really about the connections that you make with the other players here and with community groups that is gonna make things happen. Um, I know you always hear a lot about coalition building and, and community making, but not until you are really there needing the rest of the pieces of this puzzle will you understand it really means you need to get all of the players together um, into making this change happen. So I encourage everyone, even if you don't do public interest, to then go to a law firm, you know, pay your loans, and form, <laughs> Form a public interest committee in your law firm. Make them do pro bono work. There are so many ways in which you can help. If you work for the government, you know, you become a district attorney, please make sure LGBTQ youth are not wrongfully prosecuted. There are so many ways in which you can help in whatever area you go into. If you do direct legal services, you're going to be overworked and you're going to learn on your feet how to be a lawyer. Take advantage of that. Then you can become a private practitioner and do much more change if you want to later. So with that, I think I'm going to end and allow for some questions and answers if there's some trivia. Sure. Go ahead. I mean, I think that there's always going to be those, those differences, and you're going to have to invest resources in both, right? Talking to the people who don't want to do domestic partner benefits, um, but it depends whose side you're on, right? If you are on the union side not wanting to do it, then your job is going to be to not do it. If you're working on the side of the you know, employee, employees wanting to get domestic partners, or those who want to, um, you know, sometimes it really just needs to have, the, you need to be, have the opportunity to have the education on both sides, and at some point you're going to have to advocate for one client or the other, right? You, you, can't, you can't do both. Um, and so, you know, I, we know we face this type of situation when, you know, African American and immigrant um, tenants were saying, no, the reason why we have roaches is because 
the African Americans to have are dirty. What do you do then? You know, you really have to work with both and then figure out, okay, so what do we do in the end uh, to make things better for everybody? I'm not sure in the union context, you know, how that would work, but, you know, getting benefits for all employees is a good thing. It is, it is, is, it is not just, you know, getting benefits for this type of people. Otherwise, if the employer gets to know, well, we could divide and conquer, they will keep doing that. And so, you know, trying to make, trying to talk to both um, interests and then trying to find a common goal, I think it's, it's really important. Because when I did it with the tenants, it was, it was not really about let's blame who for the roaches, let's make the landlord accountable. So in the employment context, it could be the same thing. We need to get the employer accountable to provide benefits and then stop the, the divide and conquer because then, then we will all lose. That would be my I didn't know. <laughs> um, I mean, I knew I wanted to do public interest. I went to law school to become a better organizer. I did labor uh, organizing before law school. Um, my first summer, I did immigration. Um, my second summer, I did labor. And they ended up doing housing. So um, I think what Lucy said is right, right on. If you, if you find a path and the opportunities come up in this path, just follow, follow that path. I knew I, I wanted to do public interest. I knew I wanted to combine community organizing. But in law school, I, I did a constitutional litigation clinic for two years in a row because I, I knew the strengths that it would and skills that it would provide me. But I, I, did, I took specialized labor law, immigration, community development classes, and then end up doing some of it. Um, I think what's been most helpful would be to do peer peer leaders that bring this information out, or the community organizers if you have a paid or, or leaders. But I, I do think it makes a difference if if you have, for example, a, a brainstorming activity led by you as a lawyer, as opposed to you have a brainstorming activity led by another member or tenant member or leader. Things will come out very differently. And so I think that, you know, it depends on how long you've been working for the organization, how, how your relationship is with some of them. But I think in the beginning, it really helps to, like, step aside and allow those stories to come to the community organizer or to one of them, to one of the tenant leader or, you know, any leader in the organization. I think those things do look different if you do the fact-finding yourself as opposed to you allow for community involvement. <laughs> 